All right, so we have chapter six here, which is energy of a system. So the next uh, couple of chapters basically dealing with uh, this concept of energy, which is uh, sort of like a new concept that we'll be learning. But in a way, um, this you can think of like, let's say it's just a new way of solving same problems we've been you know, solving the past five chapters. So the energy is just another way, another method that we can use to solve speed, position, and those, some of those things, you know, uh, about the object's motion, right, that we did uh, in the previous chapters. It's just from a different point of view, from a point of view of energy. So basically we have this, you can say, right, energy of a system. So we can consider, you know, like let's say this, what we call energy approach, right, for solving the so same thing. That's why some of the things you will see that as we solving some of the problems, you can technically solve them using the kinematics and dynamics or the energy approach. So basically you're getting more tools in order to be able to solve problems. All right, so you can see that this concept of energy is technically considered to be like a fundamental concept because it's not just physics, but all the, the sciences basically um, you know, have this concept of energy incorporated into all the, you know, like let's say uh, geology, you know, chemistry, biology, right? So you, you probably have taken, you know, chemistry or biology classes and have talked about, you know, or learn about, you know, this energy. So it's not a, like, let's say an easy thing to explain. What is energy? We can't really see energy. We can't really touch energy, but we can calculate its effect. We can calculate, you know, energy of a system based on, you know, different things, like let's say, based on the motion of the object, based on the change in position of the object, change in shape of the object. Whenever you compress or stretch something, then you can say there's an elastic energy that, you know, uh, given to the system. When object is moving, there's a motion energy, we call it kinetic energy and different type of things. So in any case, energy can be incorporated into every aspect of, you know, uh, let's say scientific, you know, community in terms of like physics, chemistry, biology and astronomy and all of those things. And also every, you know, a part of the motion, let's say, or, or every branch, there's a, you know, physics of, um, you know, let's say waves, there's an energy in that. There's a thermodynamics, there's energy in that. There is electricity, there's energy in that. And, or, or mechanics, what we're learning right now, there's also energy part of that. So it's a little more universal. And any process, right, and every physical process, right, can be represented in terms of the energy, you know, uh, this energy of the system point of view. Okay. And one of the things we have about energy here is you can change the energy of the system or you can have a system where energy is, you know, uh, stays the same or constant. We say energy is conserved or we can transform or convert energy from one type to another. That means energy, let's say of one type can be com com completely converted to energy of another type. And that's pretty much how everything works. So let's say uh, the simple example here is uh, uh, energy coming from the sun, right? So basically sun uh, generates energy by creating nuclear, let's say reactions, right? So basically uh, nuclear reactions at the core of the, sun, of the sun create energy, then that energy as a form of light leaves the sun and then moves in empty space, right? Moves in vacuum, reaches earth. And then let's say that light energy then can be you know, let's say interacting with our solar panels and then solar panels that like, that they takes that light energy converts to chemical energy, then that chemical energy converted to electric energy, then electric energy then can be used in your house to power your television, your phones and so on and so forth. So basically what we're doing, we're converting different type of energy. Uh, and, you know, when you convert energy from one type to another, sometimes you get 100% conversion, sometimes you get less, and we will be pretty much learning all of that in the next, you know, basically next 10 chapters. Remember, we have to go all the way to about chapter 16, 17, and we will be learning about uh, all of those different types, right? Energy due to heat, energy due to, let's say, uh, motion and all of those things. But in any case, uh, it's not something easy to describe, but it's something that you know, easy for us to technically calculate and sometimes easier than using kinematics and dynamics because anything energy related is a scalar quantity, not a vector quantity, which makes our calculation a lot of times easier. All right, so you can see, right, the energy approach to describing motion is particularly useful when the force is not constant, okay? Because one of the things we learned is that 
for example, uh, going back to the chapter uh, two and three and four and five, right? So remember we have a box and let's say if this box is being pushed by constant 10 Newton force. And if it has a mass of, for example, I don't know, two kilograms, one thing I can do, I can say then force over mass is equals to 10 Newtons over two kilograms. So this is five meter per second square as an acceleration. Then I can say, all right, if this acceleration is constant, then I can use the kinematic equation one, two, three, and that, 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 right? To solve path position, velocity, you know, the time and so on and so forth. So the force was constant, acceleration was constant, acceleration was constant that I could use kinematic equations. What if the force is not constant? Then technically this five meter per second square is not constant. That means this is only true for one instant of time. After that, it changes because force is changing. Then can I use those kinematic equations? No, we can't. We can't use that because force is not constant, acceleration is not constant. And I can't use kinematic equations when acceleration is not constant. So then what do we do? Well, we can still in, let's say, higher level physics classes, we can use non-uniform motion using the, you know, the, uh, let's say the integrals and you know, derivatives and so on and so forth. That's not technically true for, you know, let's say more uh, lower you know, division classes, but it's, it's algebra based or something like that. So how do we do that in those classes? Well, generally then what we can do here is we can, uh, let's say, use the energy approach to some of, so solve some of those problems where force is not constant. All right, so this is still, it's a calculus based class. So you will see some of those advantages of using, you know, let's say calculus and things like that. But still, uh, the idea here is you can achieve the same, you know, answer, same result by using energy approach, even if your force is not constant. And it, a lot of times it makes a very, you know, simple calculations compared to what would have been in, a, you know, using kinematics and dynamics. All right, so that's some of the things we will see. Does it mean that, you know, it is only applies when the force is not constant. Well, it's actually even simpler when force is constant. But the idea here is when the force is not constant, well, technically, basically, it's just a, just a one step, a little more difficult, but so much easier compared to using, let's say, kinematics and dynamics solving for those type of problems. All right, so the global approach to problems involving energy and energy transfers will be developed in this chapter. So. And one of the things we will see here is there will be an example, right, for um, in terms of problems that we already looked at before and some new ways of, you know, solving problems. And as I said, right, the, the energy approach can be incorporated into like, let's say, you know, biological, like biophysics, you know, physical chemistry, you know, like astrophysics and everything. So all of those, you know, branches of physics, thermodynamics and things like that can be um, technically all of them can be solved from this energy point of view. All right, so we start by understanding that, you know, just like the title suggested of this chapter, energy of a system. So defining the correct system, a lot of times, you know, is the, like, let's say the first step in solving the problem successfully. Because when you have a system, well-defined system, then you can, you know, um, start defining the forces inside your system and forces outside of your system. So let's say we have then internal forces and external forces. Internal are within your system, external outside of your system. And a lot of times when we talk about external forces, so those are the forces that technically can change the energy of your system. Internal forces cannot change the energy of your system, but external forces can. So that's why if you understand what your you know, system, then it's easier for you to understand which one, which force is external, which one is internal, All right? So you can see, right, the system is a small portion of a universe. What it means is that you can think of like, let's say the system as um, just a, you know, a box sitting on a, on, a, on a floor, or you can take the floor and the box as a system, or you can take the entire room and so on. So you can see, right? So uh, when you talk about, take about system, whatever your system is, then you ignore everything else, okay? So uh, let's say critical skill is to identify the system. So your system can be a single object or a particle, as I said, the box or it can be collection of objects or particles, box on the floor, or maybe like a region of space, maybe your room, or maybe your house, or maybe your, your school, right, your laboratory, or let's say earth, you know, and thing like that, or solar system. And it can vary in size and shape. 
that means the idea here is once you you know whatever it is right you define your system then you can you know let's just set up the parameters which ones are part of the system do you have one particle ten particles how they're interacting and all of those things so it's important you know obviously in this in this class we try to simplify things right let's say um, have maybe one particle or a couple particles in the system. So generally, let's say you have to talk about some kind of very specific narrow, narrow field in physics or astronomy, let's say, where you can have, you know, much bigger, you know, system. Let's say if you're astronomy, you can maybe take uh, the solar system as your system and then everything else is basically extrasolar, right? Um, or we can say that Milky Way is your system and everything else is outside of that system and thing like that. But, you know, for our problems, for our purpose, right? We usually take maybe like one or two things. Maybe it's a, it's a box sliding on a surface. That's our, you know, system or maybe like a black box and a floor is a system. So that means, you know, you are taking two or three things into account. All right, so there's a system boundary around the system and this boundary is imaginary, right? So as I said, right, so you can take, okay, here's a box and say, all right, so here's my system and everything else is environment or can be ignored. Or you can say, you know what? That's not my system. This is my system, which now I'm taking floor into account or the ground, right? As part of my system. Because if the box is sliding, they're interacting. So then in a way you can think like if the surface is rough, some of the energy of motion of the box can be converted as a, you know, heat energy of the surface. Because when there is a friction, some of the energy can, can be dissipated as a friction due to friction, right? To thermal energy, to heat. So that's why, for example, you know, uh, if there is a friction, right? then there's always going to be a little bit of, you know, energy converted to heat. One of the things we will see later on that when energy converted to heat, that technically cannot, that energy is sometimes lost. That means you cannot take it back. You cannot convert it to something else or you cannot without paying penalties or let's say, which we'll learn in later on chapters. All right, so the boundary divides the system from the environment and the environment is the rest of the universe. Okay, so as I said, as soon as we define our system and everything else is the environment. Now, one of the things we do here is this. Um, let's say you have a box sitting on the floor and box is my system. That means I'm talking about just the box itself. Okay. Now, then I wanna look at energy, which is given generally with capital E, right? Energy of the system. Now, energy can be due to different things, okay? So there could be energy of motion or energy of changing height or energy of, uh, let's say, changing shape and things like that. So let's say right now my energy here is zero because it's not moving. So it's no, no, it doesn't have energy of motion. Let's say it's on the ground and ground is my reference point. So it doesn't have an energy of, you know, height you know, or the position, vertical position change. We're not changing its shape. So there's no, doesn't have any energy of the, uh, which would technically we call elastic energy, right? And basically no chemical involved and things like that. So there's no energy whatsoever. So then what do we do? How do we then, you know, give system energy? Okay, that means let's say I want energy, you know, to be added to the system, so that you know system can take that energy and do things like let's say it can use that energy to move. You can use that energy to change its size or shape or height and all of those things, right? So what we do here is then in from the physics point of kind of like vocabulary, right? We do work. Okay, so you can write work. In physics, you know, basically it's not the same as, you know, we use everyday life, right? Work is like a job, you go and do something like that, right? So uh, in physics, work is defined as transfer of energy into the system or out of the system, okay? So basically work is, you can say, right, work done on a system by an agent. That means, let's say, for example, um, agent is some, some, some something or somebody who's doing work, all right? Now, the way we can do work here is this, which is, some, you know, this is probably the most intuitive way of thinking like this. So think like, so you have a box just sitting there and we want to have the box, you know, gain some energy and start moving. So what do we do? Let's say you have a box sitting next to you. What to do to make it move? Well, obviously you push it. So let's say if you have a, you know, uh, an agent that pushes the box with some force, think like if you're pushing the box, box is moving. If the box is moving, it has energy. It would not be moving if it, if it didn't have energy because you know, for, for moving, you need energy. That's why we have energy of motion. Now you can see, right? 
the work done on a system by agent exerting a constant force on a system is a product of magnitude F, which is the amount of force we do, the magnitude of delta R, which is, let's say, if we start from this position R, now that the box goes to this position, you know, R initial to R final, that means there is this displacement, delta R. Okay. So then the work done is defined to be the product, or as you can say, it's proportional to the product of the force and displacement. Okay. And also of a cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the force and the displacement vector. Then we have cosine of theta. Because when you apply this force, you make the object displaced by that amount. That's the displacement. And the theta is be the angle between those two. So if, you, if you're like, let's say, not sure what the theta is right now, think like this. You have two vectors, force and delta r. Both of them right now is pointing to the right. That means both of them are zero degrees, or both of them pointing toward the you know, same direction. So the theta here is zero degrees. That means what we have here is this. Work done is equals to force or you know times delta r which is displacement that you can see right there magnitude magnitude of f then magnitude of r then times cosine of angle theta theta is angle between them so that's the equation for the work done and it's a scalar quantity it's a scalar quantity because even though you are technically using two vectors to find its volume <clears throat> this is a special type of product where you take two vectors, multiply them together, and you get a scalar as an answer. Okay. So then you can say that for now, that's the equation for the, for the work done. Okay. And which means that when you push an object and it starts moving, then you need to have the object basically change its position. If the object that changes its position because of that applied force, then there is a work done. And work done equals F times delta R times cosine theta. All right, so the displacement is the point of application of the force. Okay, so force does no work on the object if the force does not move, the, move through a displacement. That means if you, if you have a force acting on the object, but it does not contribute to the change in position, or it doesn't make the object to change position, then that force is not doing any work. Okay, so that's kind of like the, the important thing to understand. So for example, if you're pushing with some force, but it's not moving, that means you're not doing any work. Okay, so probably here there's a friction, which basically then opposes that, right? Now what happens here is that you try to transfer energy into the system, but then the friction takes away that energy by the same amount. So then there is no energy added. So the object is basically not gaining any energy. Okay. So work done by a force on a moving object is zero when the force applied is perpendicular to the displacement of its point of application. Okay, so for example, Here's my system, which is the box. And let's say you have those three forces acting on it. Okay, so then what I can say here is this. So work done is equals to, well, you have, you know, the system is the box and there are three forces. That means technically there, are, you know, I can say work done by the applied force, which is force times delta R times cosine of theta. Then there's a work done by the gravity which is, you know, mg times delta r times cosine of theta. And there is a work done by normal force, which is then, let's say, normal force times delta r times cosine of theta. Because remember, right, magnitude of the force times displacement times cosine of theta. Now, one thing I can see is this, because all of them are the magnitude product of the magnitude of the force times displacement times cosine of angle between the displacement and that force. You can see, right, for example, if this guy was 10 Newtons, and this is, let's say 30 degrees, this will be 10 times, so 10 Newtons times 30 meters, oh, sorry. Let's say this is, this is 10, uh, 10 meters, right? So 10 Newtons times 10 meters times cosine of 30 degrees, right? Then I have a non-zero. So uh, if I remember correctly, I think cosine of 30 is one half you know, uh, so that's 100, 10 times 10 hundred, so 50 um, newtons times meters technically. But you know, if, if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. So basically some number, non-zero number. 
But this one, like let's say mg, whatever it is, right? Then times 10 meters, but then times cosine of the angle between gravity and the displacement. And that's 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 gives me zero. This is also same thing, right? Normal force times 10 meters times cosine of 90, because that's also 90. What I get, I get zero, right? That means force that is perpendicular to the displacement when the object is moving doesn't contribute to the work done. That means normal force and gravity in this particular example doesn't change energy of the system. They don't add energy to the system or they don't remove energy of the system. So basically they are, you know, not contributing whatsoever. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, one thing you can see from here. So as I mentioned, work is a scalar quantity. It can be either negative or positive. We will see some instances, you know, where it's negative, where it's positive, where it's zero. So when the object is lifted, the work done by the applied force on the object is positive because the direction of the force is upward and it's in the same direction as the displacement. So in a way you can think like this, when the force or a component of the force is in the same direction as the displacement, then it contributes a, you know, as, a, as a positive work done, which means energy added to the system. You know, as, you know, as object basically is lifted, the work done by the gravitational force on the object is negative. Because if you have an object that is being displaced upward, some delta y, so the gravity acting in opposite direction, which means it's doing negative work. Negative work means that gravity in this, in this particular example actually, you know, takes energy out of the system. Because work, when it's positive, energy is added. Work when is negative, energy is removed from the system, right? So the energy can be added or can be removed and that depends on what kind of, you know, work you calculate. Work is positive when you calculate at the end, energy is then added by that force. Work is negative, energy then is removed by that force. And when work is zero, then um, no change when energy is not changed. I mean, it, this particular force doesn't add or subtract, so basically. All right, so, um, okay, so it's important information there. So now, remember I, I gave you the units for the, you know, work done um, as Newtons times meters because it's force times displacement, you know, uh, but technically what we do here is this. So work done is equals to F delta R cosine of theta so force is in Newtons, delta R is in meters. Well, cosine of theta is dimensionless. That means you have Newtons times meters on the right side. So now what we do here, we define that to be joules or joule, which is then the unit for the uh, work done and technical unit for the energy. So the joule is a unit that represents, let's say one Newton of force pushing a, you know object through a displacement of one meter. That's basically one joule. All right, so that means work done, which is amount of energy transferred into the system or out of the system has units of joules, which basically then also every energy that we're gonna be encountering, right, also has the same unit. All right, so these are, you know, the next three slides, I'm gonna show you under which conditions work done is positive, under which conditions work done is negative. So you can see here is this, this is our object and it's moving from its initial to its final position. So let's say this is X initial, and this is L, or R, R initial, this is R final. Blue arrow is the displacement, red is the force. Green is the velocity. Because one of the things we can see here, as I said, right, if, you, if you're pushing in the direction of the displacement, you can technically make the object move faster because you're transferring energy into the system, then you can think of like this, right? If you transfer energy into the system, into the system it can then move faster because it's gaining energy and energy can be converted into motion energy. Now, here's what I have. If displacement, you can see, right? If F here is, you know, I hat, and R here is basically also I hat, all of the forces I had, displacement are, you know, delta R, I hat. Then what you have here is, for this particular, it's zero degree angle between them. So work becomes F times delta R because cosine of zero degree is one. So F times delta R times one becomes 
F times delta R. And it's positive because, you know, you are using magnitude of the force and magnitude of the displacement, always positive. And since cosine of theta is also positive, then you get positive sign for the W. And energy is transferred into the system, the particle speeds up. So K here is actually what we call for the kinetic energy. K increases, it means energy of motion increases. Now what we have here is the force that is at an angle. Well, one of the things you can see here is this, even if it's at an angle, if theta is less than 90 degrees, then F delta R cosine theta is still positive and energy is transferred into the system. So we're gonna get a smaller value, right? Because for example, 10 times 10 times, you know, cosine of zero is 100. But for example, 10 times 10 times cosine of 30 is 50, okay? All right, just double check this. So basically the cosine of 30 is actually not one half, it's 0.866. So this is basically 80, uh, let, let's say roughly 87. But still, you know, it's less than when it was zero. That means, you know, as the theta increases, the energy, right, basic amount of energy added, right, starts decreasing. So let's say when, you know, cosine, uh, let's say 45 will be less, cosine of 60 will be less and so on and so forth. Um, that means, you know, but as long as theta less than 90 degree, you still get a positive uh, work done. What happens when the force is, you know, uh, let's say perpendicular, 90 degrees? Well, in that case, look at the green arrow. Whatever velocity or so whatever speed you had, basically you're gonna have the same speed before and after because work done is zero since theta is 90 degrees. So, well, I mean, that means no energy transferred, speed and kinetic energy or energy of motion here is basically constant. Okay, so again, so K here is known as a kinetic energy. And this is known as energy of motion. Okay, so we'll talk about that in great detail, so. All right, so then what happens when the force is such that you have a theta greater than 90 degrees? That means let's say object is moving to the right and the force is applying let's say 120 degrees or something like that. Well, obviously you can think like this, if this is a box and it's being pulled in that direction and it's moving to the right, you can imagine, right? It's gonna slow down. Well, but it's gonna slow down because you can think of like from the energy point of view. Because when I calculate this quantity with the theta greater than 90 degrees, I'm gonna get a negative sign because cosine of 120, cosine of 150, cosine of 100, they're gonna give me a negative number. And negative number means that energy is transferred out of the system the particle slows down, which means kinetic energy decreases. Again, we want to think of like right now, like right now, not from the point of view, let's say forces and displacement and all of those things, right? But from the energy point of view, that means using force and displacement, I can calculate the work down. And if it's negative, that means energy is transferred out of the system. That's why it's going to slow down. And if you have the force is in the opposite direction of the displacement where theta is 180, then you can, you can kind of get maximum amount of, you know, a negative work done. That means maximum amount of energy transferred out of the system, which again means that object will slow down, kinetic energy will decrease. But those are the conditions. We can think like this. Work done is positive if theta is between zero and but less than 90. Work done is zero when theta is equal to 90 and work done is then negative for the, you know, theta that is greater than 90 but less than one, less than or equals 180 degrees. So this is then, you know, when you get your work done, positive, negative, or zero. Okay, so make sure you guys, you know, clear on this, make sure you guys understand all that. All right, so let's look at this, you know, uh, this example over here. You have a 15 kilo, a person pulls a 50 kilogram crate, 40 meter along the horizontal floor by a constant force of 100 newtons, which acts at 37 degrees as shown. Now, what I, what I have here is this then. The floor is smooth and, no exert, and exerts no friction force, which is good because that means I don't have to worry about friction force. So calculate the work done by each force acting on the crate and then calculate the net work done on the crate. All right, so technically I have, if you look at free body diagram, I have three forces. So work done by the applied force will be applied force times displacement times cosine of theta 
uh, work done by the normal force, which is normal force times displacement times cosine of theta and work done by gravity, which is mg delta x cosine of theta. All right, so one thing I can see here is then the work done by applied force is then 100 newtons times uh, 40 meter, right? Then times cosine of 37. And let's see, so 100 times 40 times cosine of 37. Um, so I should be getting 3,194 joules, right? So roughly speaking, 3,194 joules. So this is amount of you know work done by the applied force. Well, how about the, the normal force? Well, if I look at normal force, so this will be whatever the normal force is. By the way, the normal force right now, if you look at those two, is equals to mg, right? So, but still, normal force times then delta you know delta x and then cosine of 90 degrees. Because normal force perpendicular to displacement, that means it's zero. Gravitational force again mg delta x cosine of 90 because it's perpendicular again gives you zero so when i'm calculating net which is for part b this will be then work done by the applied force or pulled force right or push force uh, i guess pull right then work done by the normal plus work done by the gravitational so it will be 3194 3, joules plus zero plus zero so 3194 joules. And since it's positive, that means work done is added to the system. So then the system gained that much energy. So system gains amount of energy as the net work done, which is this, you know, and you can see, right, I'm just adding them algebraically because those are pretty much scalar quantities. I can just algebraically add them together once I find work done by each force. All right, so now, Let's look at that uh, product that I mentioned, right? So the work done is F times delta R times cosine of theta. Well, then technically those two quantities are vectors and I am doing a vector product. So in physics, we have two vector products. One vector product is, you know, when you multiply two vectors together, you are then getting a scalar quantity as an answer. So this is basically thing like this you know, product of two vectors, you're giving, getting a scalar. So then we call this a dot product, okay, or, or a scalar product. So scalar or dot product. And what I have here is then this, um, dot product, so we use like a dot like that between those, right, A dot B. So let's, let's say we have two vectors, A and B. So then you have, that product between vector a and vector b then a dot b is equals to then you take magnitude of a times magnitude of b times cosine of angle between them okay that means if you have their magnitudes of those two vectors then you can just multiply the magnitudes then times cosine of angle between them and this is what you know the general equation for the dot product is that means that product between any two vectors is the product of their magnitudes then times cosine of angle between them. So that's why you have force times displacement, cosine of theta is basically the dot product between force and the displacement vectors. So like this is F dot dr or F dot delta r. That means the work done is basically that product between force and displacement. All right, so then one of the things we have about uh, the dot product here is this. It's a, it's a scalar product and it's, you know, it's actually commutative. That means A dot B is same as B dot A. So if you do delta R dot F, you're going to get the same thing as F dot delta R. Okay. You can also have distributive law of multiplication where you do A dot quantity B plus C, it equals to A dot B plus A dot C. I don't remember ever using this in this class, but it's something to, to basically know. Right. So that means this is what we're dealing with. So we are dealing with a dot product. 
That means if you know the quantity A and B in terms of its magnitude and direction and the angle between them, it's just a simple A, B cosine theta. All right. So, uh, and assuming obviously if it's a, if it's a you know, constant value in this particular case. But a lot of times, you know, you might be given, um, let's say not the, 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 the force or the displacement or vectors A and B, not in terms of its magnitude and direction, but maybe its components. So let's say we have this. And remember, you know, uh, you have those unit vectors, right? So let's say you are given these two vectors, A and B. A has an X, Y, Z component, B has an X, Y, Z component, right? And what we wanna do here is this. So basically those are my, are my two vectors given in terms of their components. Now, here's one thing I can do. Step one, let's say, or you know, approach one. I can find A. I can find A by basically finding its you know, magnitude, AX squared plus AY squared plus AZ squared. I can find that. Then I can find the theta A. Then I can find B. So square of, you know, A, um, sorry, BX squared plus BY squared plus BZ squared. Then I can find theta of B and then compare them to find the angle between them. Because when I'm finding theta, I'm finding it with respect to some reference position. But then what I need here is I need the theta, which is between them, okay? So between A vectors A and B. Then I can use the you know, regular dot product that I have from previous slides. But then here's what I have. There is now another method that we can use, which is I think a little bit easier to use that. So where I use just directly the, the, the component dot product, okay? Using the from the components point of view. But here's one thing we should, you know, before doing that, we should kind of like see that. For example, let's say you have vector i hat. Remember, this is vector i hat. Let's say my second vector is also i hat. Well, they should be the same, the same length. So let's say I have two vector i hats and I'm doing i hat dot i hat. What do I get? Remember, that product is basically magnitude of the first one times magnitude of the second one, times cosine of the angle between them. But I had that, I had their, each magnitude is one, times cosine, but both of them in the same directions of cosine of zero. That means I had that, I had is one times one times one equals one. How about if you have two J hat vectors? Well, J hat that J hat is equals to then again, one times one times cosine of zero, because both of them in the same direction, angle between them is zero. Again, I get one. And that's what I have. So here I'm actually missing equals one. So this is what I have for the top. I had that I had equals J hat that J hat equals K hat that K hat equals one. It means that product between the same unit vectors equals to one. But what if my vectors are like this? What if I have I hat and J hat? What do I do in that case? Well, if I had that J hat becomes this, magnitude of I hat is one times magnitude of J hat, which is also one, and times cosine of the angle between those two, but I hat and J hat are perpendicular. So it's cosine of 90, what I get is zero. That means I had that J hat is zero, or I had that K hat is zero, or J hat that K hat is zero. That means, or, or I had time that K, hat. all of those are zero basically because they are perpendicular to one another. That means two vectors, two unit vectors that are perpendicular to one another, they give me zero. So then here's what I can have. Using this, you know, logic, then I can say, all right, so my A dot B is equal to this. It's my A here is AX I hat plus AYJ hat plus AZK hat. And this is dot bx i hat plus byj hat plus bz k hat. Now let's see what I get. Remember that, um, you know, I can distribute, right? So I, I can do i hat, you know, ax i hat times bx i hat. So it becomes ax bx, then i hat that i hat, then plus, and then, you know, this is with that. Then I have I, ax by, then I had that J hat, then plus like that, right? Then oh, that's probably gonna be really long for me to do that. So let me kind of make it a little bit simpler for me. 
but the idea is going to be the same. So let's do the, just two, dim, two dimensional like that. So uh, then I can do uh, AY with that. It would have been taken too long for me, sorry. Sorry, uh, then um, what I have here is AY, BX, J hat that I had, then plus AY, BY, J hat that J hat. That's it. Okay, so now what I get here is this. This first term, AX times BX, I hat times I hat. But I hat that I hat is one, so I end up with just AX, BX plus. This one is AX, BY times I hat that J hat. But I just said that I had that J hat is zero, then this entire term is zero. This one, AYBX, J hat that I had, well, J hat that I had, remember, I had that J hat is equals to J hat that I had. Remember that that's the, that's the rule, right? The, the commutative. That means this is also zero because they are perpendicular. This one, AYBY times J hat that J hat, J hat that J hat is one, right there, right? It becomes just, you know, A, Y, B, Y. That means A dot B vectors would end up just being product of their X components plus product of their Y components plus then product of their Z components, if I done that too. But that's kind of what we have. So you can see, right? You basically get that. A, X, B, X plus A, Y, B, Y plus A, Z times B, Z. And the interesting thing here is that there's no information about direction. And you shouldn't have any information about direction because what you're calculating is a scalar quantity. Just some number plus another number plus another number, you get a number, okay? And that's what we have for the dot product. That means you are just basically multiplying them together to vectors, but because you're using this dot product approach, you are pretty much getting um, a scalar quantity with no information about direction, just, just some number with the unit. All right, so let's look at then actual, so like an actual example. So you have two vectors, A and B, are given by A is two I hat plus three J hat, B is negative I hat plus two J hat. We want to determine the scalar product A dot B. All right, so what we have is this then, A dot B is equals to two I hat plus three J hat, then dot minus I hat plus two J hat. Okay, so then technically you can have this, right? So you can say, right, my AX is equals to two. My AY is equals to three. BX is equals to negative one. BY is equals to two. Because remember, at the end, you end up just this, right? AX, BX plus AY, BY, that's it. And then you can say, all right, so my AX is two. My BX is negative one plus my AY is three, my BY is two. So this will be two times negative one, so negative two plus three times two, so six. So we get negative two plus six, we get four. And there is no information about you know, direction or anything like that, we just, just four, right? So can we have negative four? Yes, of course. But you know that's just a basically a number, right? So nothing, not necessarily in terms of direction because this is not a, you know, directional quantity, so it's a, it's a scalar. All right, so part B is find the angle theta between, you know, A and B. All right, so this is when, where we do have to, you know, uh, you know, let's say if you're finding the theta between A and B. So here's probably the easiest way, uh, easiest way to go and find that. So let's do the mag magnitude of A, which will be then um, two, which is X component squared plus three which is y component squared, so we get, uh, let's say, square root of 13. And we find b, minus of b, which is minus one square plus two square. Okay, so if you have the components, we just, you can use that to find the magnitude. So you get then square root of five. All right, so that means we have the magnitude of a and b. So now, remember that equation, right? Sorry. So we have a dot b, equals a b cosine of theta, where a dot b is the, the, their dot product, on the right side, the, their magnitude product, right, times cosine of angle. 
I can rearrange and say, okay, then cosine of theta is equals to a dot b divided by a b. So basically, you know, rearrange that equation. Well, because I have what a dot b is. In the previous part, we calculated it's four. And I have then a and b, you know, separately. So then this is square root of 13 times square root of, you know, five. And what we get here is we get four over square root of 65. It is just 13 times five. Then I have cosine of theta is equal to that. Then all I have to do is just solve for the inverse cosine to find the theta. So it will be four over square root of 65. Then we get 60.3 degrees. That means this is the angle between them. That means if let's say, for example, A is on the first quadrant, like let's say pointing to the right, which is not, but let's say it is, then this will be B and the angle will be, you know, 60.3 degrees between them. Now let's say, obviously, you know, A is not one dimensional because it has X and Y component, but you can kind of like plot that, right? Given those information. All right, so that's how you would find the direction. All right, so now what we have is this, work done by a varying force. So that was good because we were working with the force that was constant. But what if we have a, you know, time, you know, a position varying force? That means what we're doing here is we have a force that varies with position. So think like that box that you're pushing. Imagine you're pushing that box for 40 meters, all right? So that's a really long distance to try to keep a constant force. Most of the time your force is gonna, you know, weaken or, you know, become stronger at the different parts of the, you know, like that distance. So that's why what we can do here is this. So let's say you go from, uh, I don't know, 10 meters to maybe like, let's say uh, 20 meters. So you're pushing the box for 10 meters. Your force tank can technically be changing with strength as you're pushing because sometimes maybe there's a little bit, you know, friction or something like that. So you push harder or you get, you know, tired at the end, you kind of, you know, decrease the strength, you know, let's say. So force changes with position. Now then this equation work equals F delta R cosine theta cannot be used because it's only used if force is constant. And if force is not constant, then you cannot use that equation. But it's, a, it's another way because this is a calculus based class we can understand that one thing we can do here is we can take this and break it down into very, very, very small segments where the force for that tiny delta, delta X is technically can be considered constant, okay? So assume that during a very small displacement DX, the force is constant. Then we can calculate work done for each of those small segments. So segment one, two, three, four, five, six, and all the ways calculate all that, okay? Then what we can do, we can calculate the total work by adding all those, you know, the work done by each segment. So it becomes the sum going from X initial to X final, FX, Delta X, okay. And obviously we know from Calc 1, right, um, that, you know, that's nothing but uh, this, you know, the integral, right, of the, you know, that those two quantities, right. That means if I, if I wanna find you know, and, you know, the, the work done for each tiny segment and I'm adding them together, you know, summing them up as the, let's say the, the delta X approaches zero, right? Then that basically becomes uh, an integral. And for this particular case, I'm, I'm just basically summing up all of those, you know, tiny, you know, let's say segments together and that summation, right? Becomes pretty much the area under that curve, which in this case is the, uh, let's say, what we call the work done. That means the area under the force versus position curve is then the work done, okay? And the equation is basically the integral from, you know, X initial to X final, FX DX. All right, so the work done is equal to the area under the curve. That means we can also do this. If you have a, a graph where the work done can be, you know, where the force is plotted, you know, against position, you can technically use the area under that to find the work done. Obviously it becomes more complicated when the, you know, that graph is, you know, not, you know, some symmetric line or something like that. It's not easy to find, but you know, you can then just basically use this into in this equation to integrate that, All right? So now what we have is this. So the net work is equals to the external work, right? The work done by external forces, which is, you know, integral of some of the forces times Delta R. So in a way, one thing we can do here is we can 
do two ways finding the total work done. I can find the work done by each force, each external force, and then add them, add, add all the work done together. Let me think like this. So work done is equals to work by force one plus force two plus force three plus force four and so on and so forth. Or I can find the net force acting on the object and say then work done is equals to then net force that displacement integral. That means I can just look at net force times displacement and take the integral of that to find the net work done. That means you have two different ways to technically do that, okay? And external here means that work done by an external agent. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, right, the work done by internal agent basically uh, always zero because internal agents, right, don't change the system energy. They can convert energy from one type to another, which we'll see later on, but they don't convert energy uh, or change the energy of the system. All right, so let's do this example here. You have a three kilogram particle moving along the x-axis has a velocity of two meter per second as it passes through the origin. Okay, actually I'm gonna wait uh, a little bit later to solve this problem. We'll come back to this problem in a little bit. All right, so because that, that problem required kinetic energy, which we technically haven't talked about yet. So let's do this. So let's derive um, equation for the work done by some kind of very specific non-constant force, and that's a spring force. So remember, the work done by spring, so whenever there's a, you know, uh, let's say you have a spring, for example, here's a spring, and you have something attached to the spring, and the spring is sitting at some equilibrium position. So let's say this is the, you know, spring is not stretched or compressed. So, uh, so basically we're looking at the application of what we call Hooke's law. So think like this, you take this, you know, to, the, to take the block and let's say you push it to the right or to the left. That means for example, you are, you know, now stretching this to somewhere over here, some position X from the equilibrium. What we have here is then the force from the spring, which we call a restoring force, gonna try to then push the system back toward equilibrium. So we call this F of S, spring force. And this spring force is a restoring force, which then always, you know, comes from the, you know, elastic object like a spring. You take the spring, you stretch, or stretch or compress, as soon as you let go, it goes to its original shape. Why? Because there's this restoring force always pushing the system back toward equilibrium. And that's what we have. And this force is a variable force. It's proportional to the negative of the position change. That means, you know, one of the things we have here is, that means technical things like this, it's proportional to the position. So more you stretch, stronger the force, which means it's not constant. It's a variable, right? It's, it, it's a depend on, you know, on X. So you can say force of spring as a, as a function of X is equals to negative K times X. Now, what is, um, what is K? Well, K is a spring constant or a force constant you can think of like it's a proportionality constant because if it's proportional to negative of X, when I go from proportionality sign to equal sign, I introduce a constant that that's a you know, spring constant, right? Like we've seen. Then the spring constant K then will be in terms of, um, let's say information about the stiffness of the spring, if it's stiff or not. When it's really stiff, K is very large. When it's like kind of loose, K is sm you know, small, maybe like five, 10 or something like that. Now, what we have here is this then. Uh, this force is basically, as right, you can see, right? This force is basically a, a variable force. It's not a constant force because it changes with position. Okay. So this force is known as a Hooke's law. So the, this, this force basically, not the force, but this equation known as a Hooke's law, where the spring force or elastic force related to the position change of the object. All right, so then you can say that it's given in this, this form that force of spring is equals to Fs I had, and it's equals to negative Kx because F of S equals negative Kx I had, which means that it's a, you know, let's say in this particular content is a horizontal force, the one that I'm doing right now on the, on the, um, in, on the slide, it's a horizontal force. And this negative actually is important because look at the direction of the object's displacement which is to the right 
and the direction of the force acting on the object, which is to the left. And they're in opposite direction, so this negative represents that. Because if I would take this system, for example, and I would compress it instead of stretching, so compress it to this position X, now my displacement will be to the left, but the force will be to the right in this case. Why? Because that's where the equilibrium is, right? In, to the right of that. Because this force always pointing toward the equilibrium and it's always gonna be in the opposite direction of the displacement. You displace the object to the right, forces to the left. You displace it to the left, force will be to the right. And this negative represents that. That force displacement always have opposite sign, opposite directions. So this is again, this is known as a Hooke's law, okay? So here's the example of that, right? So you take the block, you push it to the right, see the displacement is to the right, forces to the left. When object is in equilibrium, which is basically in the, you know, it's equilibrium position, it's a reference position, the spring force is zero because, you know, there's nothing to restore. The spring is basically in equilibrium. But as soon as you again move it from equilibrium to the left, then the spring force now acting on the object, trying to push it toward the equilibrium, in this case, displacement to the left, forces to the right. And this is, if you plot that, you're gonna get a graph like that. So technically the graph for the spring force is something like this. Okay, All right, so maybe something like that, where it's only const, it, it's, it's only like linear, that means the relationship force is proportional to X, only linear relationship, right? Or negative X for the small segment or small portion where you can stretch or compress and the force is proportional to displacement. Why is it only for the small segment uh, because, or, or, or small range, right? That's because the, if you take spring and you compress it all the way to, I don't know, another room or something like that, you're probably gonna, you're gonna you know, uh, basically um, change the property, right? So you're gonna deform it so much that when you let go, even if there's a, you know, a restoring force, it's not gonna be able to go back to its original shape because it's been deformed so much, so badly that it's not gonna go back to keep its original shape. That means what we're doing here, we're only looking at you know, sort of like a small range where you can stretch or compress and the force can bring it back to its original shape without any deformation or anything like that. All right, so then what do I have here is this. So the force exerted by a spring is always directed opposite the displacement of equilibrium. And because the spring force always acts towards the equilibrium, it is sometimes called a restoring force, as I mentioned. Now, here's, a, let me show you then the derivation of this equation. So let's say here's the work done which is equals to, as I'm, you know, as I mentioned, right, for the general equation for the work done is then the dot product between force and displacement. All right, so now what I have here is this, then this, if this is a spring force and work done by the spring force, then this is negative kx i hat. And then this is basically dr becomes dx i hat. And this is a dot product between them. Now what I'm doing, I'm going from X initial to X final. All right, so what I have here is this, K here is a constant, it's always a constant, so it can come out of integral. Okay, so I can technically think about that. So it can come out of integral. So I can say it's equals to integral. And what I can do here is basically, you know, going from X initial to X final, so the K comes out. And so then I can even, let's say take out negative. So it becomes an X. Remember this is I hat dot I hat, which is equals to one. That means I have just X DX. Okay, so X DX. And this is equal to then negative K, then X DX becomes, you know, X square over two. Now X initial to X final. Well then technically this can, this, this can change depending on what you want. So you can say it goes from zero to X max, then X max can be either to the right or to the left, okay? That means the idea here is this. So then the work done by the spring force is just equals to one half KX, you know, technically like let's say X max, let me put it like that, so X max squared. That's the equation for that. So you can either say going from zero to X max to the right or from zero to X max to the left, but it doesn't matter. So that means this is how you derive the equation for the work. 
as means you can see, right, work done is not equals to spring force times delta R times cosine of theta. No, it's not equals to that. If it's a spring force, then it's equals to one half K times X max squared. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, what we have. That's basically the derivation for the spring force. All right, so let's do an example here. So if a 10 centimeter long spring is attached to the ceiling. When a two kilogram mass is hanged from it, the spring, st spring stretches to a length of 15 centimeters. Now this is a typical experiment we do in class. You have a spring hanging. So this is now it's in equilibrium. That means nobody's pushing or pulling. Okay. That means we take this to be equilibrium position. Now technically an equilibrium here is negative 10 centimeters referencing the ceiling. Then what I have here is this, when I attach this mass, then I'm applying force equals to the gravitational force, right? The weight of the black. So then the, you know, the spring starts start stretching. As soon as it starts stretching, then there's a you know, spring force, which starts increasing, increasing, because remember, if you move it further from equilibrium, it starts increasing. So it increases until at some point, those two equal to one another and system comes to rest. That means what I have here is this. So f of g minus f of, it doesn't matter technically, right? So um, f of g, let's say minus f of spring equals zero. That's the condition I want. That means when it stretches to about 15 centimeters, that means we are talking about when the system comes to rest again. That means the spring force becomes so strong that it matches the gravitational force and the system comes to rest. Which, which means magnitudes are the same. So f of g is equals to f of spring, which means then negative kx is equal to then, m, well, not kx, and like delta y, right? Is equal to m, m, mg, which means their magnitudes are the same. Remember, delta y is the displacement. Then, sorry, then k here is equals to mg over negative delta y. Well, it's uh, two kilograms times 9.8, divided by negative and delta y here is basically by how much it, it, it was displaced, right? So then you can say then this is basically going from, um, so going to the negative 15 centimeters from the initial of then negative 10 centimeters because it was negative 10 initially and then it displaced to negative 15. So then I have that Negative is going to cancel out with this negative eventually. And I'm going to get 392 newtons per meters. That's the unit of the spring constant K. So spring constant K is 392 newtons per meters because it's force over the, the length, right? All right, so that's my spring constant K. That's part A. Part B says, how long is the spring when the three kilogram mass is suspended from that? Well, the spring constant K is a constant. That means it's information about this spring, which means that it's always gonna be the same. Once you calculate it, it's not, doesn't matter if it stretches five, 10, 15, by 10 kilogram, by 20 kilogram, as long as it doesn't deform, spring constant is the same. But for part B, we're saying that, okay, so instead of the two kilogram, I attach three kilogram, and I wanna know by how much it will be stretched until spring and gravitational forces again match each other, which means the spring force, right? You know, of f of spring, right, is equal to then f of g again. So then I'm still having this negative k times delta y is equals to mg. It's just in this particular case, I don't know what my delta y is because I have different weight. So then it's going to be like mg. I guess I can say m2g, but same thing, right? So this is m for part b. Divide by the negative k. Okay, so then now it's three kilograms times 9.8 over negative 392 Newton per meters. And this one gonna give me negative 17.5 centimeters. If I calculate this, I'm gonna get neg negative, um, sorry, technically if I calculate this, I should get um, negative 0 0.075 meters. All right, and from here I can say, all right, so since delta y is equals to negative 0 0.075 meters, then what I can do here is this. Um, well, 
let's say y final minus y initial, right? So I can do it from that, which is 0 0.075, negative 0 0.75 meters. And then y final is equals to then y initial, you know, minus 0 0.075 meters. And since this guy was, you know, technically negative 0 0.1, then I get y final as negative uh, 0.175 meters or negative 17.5 centimeters. And that's my final answer for this.